Excellency, your, the High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom, uh, Mr. Sarna, um, Eric Bergloff, Director, LSC Institute of Global Affairs, distinguished guests, including all the students here. Um, thanks for having me this morning. And uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, a little is uh, where we are in the uh, global um, uh, outlook at this point and why this suggests that we need something better to take care of uh, the global monetary slash financial system than we have today. In fact, today we don't really have much of a system. Uh, we need something in place. And uh, what I want to do is talk about some of the forces at play today and, and why this, uh, this creates need for such a system. I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, the recovery has been long awaited uh, post-financial crisis and is yet to be seen as strong and sustained. Um, we have uh, a multi-speed outlook uh, across the globe. Um, within industrial countries, we have differences in growth rates, some of which are tied to which countries deleveraged early and, uh, and dealt with some of the uh, debt issues uh, up front. Uh, perhaps the United States might fall in, in that category, and those which postponed uh, or have yet to uh, deleverage fully. Uh, and perhaps some countries in Europe might fall there. Uh, within emerging markets and developing countries, again, we have uh, differential rates of growth. Uh, most recently, commodity producers uh, uh, seem to be adversely affected, many in Latin America uh, and some in Africa, uh, while commodity consumers seem to be better off. But even before that, we had those who spent uh, very heavily post-crisis suddenly coming up against the constraints of, uh, of that kind of spending. Uh, result, that kind of spending resulted in high leverage, uh, and, and uh, uh, countries like Brazil uh, and to some extent China have slowed down as a result of that post-crisis spending. Um, and between industrial countries and emerging markets, uh, again, there is a differential pace of, uh, of growth. Um, in, in some sense, you know, paraphrasing Tolstoy, uh, happy countries, uh, um, you know, are all alike. They all seem to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, they don't seem to have some of these problems, but unhappy countries, each unhappy country is unhappy in its own way. We can find a problem per country uh, and explain why that country is do it, not doing so well. But I think there are some common forces. Uh, I think uh, the world is much more integrated than we thought. Uh, remember, post-financial crisis, there was some talk of decoupling the emerging markets running away from the industrial countries with strong growth. And then we found that the emerging markets suddenly were jerked back uh, because they were linked to the same sort of common global forces. So, so while I think you can find an explanation per country, there are some common global forces at work, and we need to understand what they are. Uh, and, and I have to say the state of thinking here is still uh, developing. We still don't have clear answers, but they, they do seem to be um, some forces that we can point to. So let me talk about what these forces might be. Why is it that broadly across the world uh, we have headwinds to growth? Uh, the, the most obvious is the effects of debt, that uh, perhaps sustainable global growth even before the great financial crisis was, uh, was less than what uh, um, you know, uh, both the pol political establishment as well as people desired, and growth was pumped up across the world through leverage that people borrowed to spend, whether at the household level or at the government level uh, or even at the corporate level. And uh, post-financial crisis, and this is what I started with, uh, a number of uh, uh, countries have been held back by the subsequent uh, deleveraging. And even if the emerging markets didn't do much of this uh, pre-financial crisis, you could explain their slowdown as post-financial crisis, they find that their sources of demand, they were exporting uh, uh, for growth, and the countries that were buying their stuff now are held back by the deleveraging. 
So the emerging markets have to find their own domestic sources of growth. Many find it in the same sort of answer that industrial countries found, which is let people borrow and spend or let governments borrow and spend or let, let local governments borrow and spend. And that growth also has come to an end. So we're all in the process of deleveraging. So that is one explanation, I think, uh, which uh, probably the biggest proponents are uh, Reinhard Rogoff uh, uh, with their wonderful book, This Time is Different, as well as subsequent ar articles. But, but since then, uh, people have also asked the question, uh, well, if in fact the world was growing so slowly before the great financial crisis, why was that? What were the deeper forces that, was, that were creating this relatively slow growth? Uh, what, what changed in, in the world? And you can go back and there are uh, a whole bunch of explanations, but I think two are, are, uh, 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 have become quite prominent. Uh, one is that uh, a number of industrial countries are experiencing population aging, and the most, recent, uh, the, the most uh, obvious is Japan, uh, but also you see a number of countries in Europe aging. And uh, there is, um, of course, the second largest economy in the world, China, uh, which may be aging before it has gotten to the levels of income that industrial countries have got too. So um, we don't fully understand what the consequences of population aging are on savings and investment. Uh, is savings, are, are savings likely to pick up as populations near retirement age? Uh, when do savings get run down? What about investment? If I know my population is aging, should I sort of curb uh, investment because there's not much domestic demand uh, growth likely in the future? These are questions we, we don't have good, good answers to. We don't even know how to measure GDP in the face of, uh, of population aging, at least uh, we don't know how to uh, communicate it in a reasonable way. David Pilling of the Financial Times had an article sometime back saying, well, with Japan, uh, Japan's labor force shrinking uh, at 1% to 2% a year, perhaps the right metric for Japan in terms of calling a recession would be if growth falls below negative 2 because labor force is shrinking, GDP out, uh, will, will naturally shrink also, uh, even uh, if things are, are reasonable. Uh, but yet we keep calling a Japanese recession any time growth falls below zero. So that's an example of how we haven't even adjusted the GDP numbers to think about population aging and the consequences for the workforce. Uh, but, but broadly, we really don't understand what this does to aggregate demand. And the biggest problem in the world today is, of course, aggregate demand across the globe is, is weak. Um, a second factor, which may play into this, maybe, maybe, maybe different, is productivity has slowed down, uh, productivity growth. And, and this is uh, you know, hard to understand for the lay public because you're surrounded by so many uh, descriptions of innovation, of, uh, of people doing things better, do, people th doing things in a more clever way. And uh, so we're surrounded by innovation, we're surrounded by potential productivity improvements, but doesn't show up in the numbers, right? Uh, and and why, is that, why is that so? Why aren't we seeing the effects of stronger productivity growth in the numbers? There are at least four ec explanations, and very quickly, uh, one is the measurement problem, that uh, perhaps uh, what is happening is the goods we're seeing today are better than the goods uh, we bought yesterday. A car today is much, much uh, better than the car we bought 10, 15 years ago. It's packed with a whole lot of new gadgets, it's safer, got airbags, got, uh, you know, it may still uh, drive you at 55, 60 miles per hour, but, uh, but there's a lot more to the car than it, there was earlier. So uh, essentially, it's hard to measure quality. And because we are under measuring quality, uh, the car today may be 1.2 times the car yesterday, but it still counts as one extra car. And in that sense, uh, when we measure productivity, we are under measuring productivity growth. Or put differently, uh, the people who, who propose this would suggest that we are over-measuring inflation. Inflation is too high relative to the real inflation because we're getting more bang for the buck today when we buy 
some of these products, and therefore GDP, uh, nominal GDP, deflated by an overly high inflation rate, results in a overly low real GDP. And so the argument is we are undermeasuring growth. We are undermeasuring growth because we are undermeasuring quality. Okay. Now th there's some some possible truth to this. How much it accounts for uh, the undermeasurement uh, is uh, is hard to say. But uh, but people are working on this. Marty Feldstein from the U.S. is is a, is a big proponent of this. A second possibility is the monetization problem, right? And um, some of you uh, students uh, 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 may may understand that GDP uh, doesn't me measure every good and service that's produced in the economy. It just measures those that are monetized, right? And that's a problem with GDP. It's a problem that we've known about since uh, since its uh, concept of GDP was first first uh, m uh, mooted. And and uh, anybody I don't pay. Their work doesn't count for GDP. As soon as I start paying them, their work does count. And uh, the, the famous example is in Paul Samuelson. Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, a wealthy lady marries her chauffeur, GDP goes down. Okay, so that's the that was the uh, the concept, but it shows up today in a different form. Uh, earlier, you used to go to the theater to see movies, and uh, used to pay for entrance. Uh, and uh, there'd be a clerk uh, working to sell tickets. There used to be ushers, this, that. Today, you watch that same movie or something better, some short uh, episode on YouTube, and you don't pay anything for it. So GDP has gone down because now you watch YouTube, but your sense of satisfaction may have gone up, right? Because now you have much more flexibility and freedom. So the monetization problem would say, we still have to figure out how to monetize all this. When we do figure out, uh, it will start showing up in GDP. But for the moment, people are as happy as before, except we don't measure their happiness uh, because it doesn't show up. A third problem, and this is more uh, uh, um, sort of specific to the crisis and the response, is that it may be that we haven't put firms out of their misery. What do I mean by that? Uh, good crises tend to clean up uh, uh, industry. Uh, only the more productive firms survive. Um, while uh, if, on the other hand, you intervene a lot in a crisis and uh, uh, flood the system with liquidity, etc., yes, there is some uh, uh, liquidation that happens, but less than in an ordinary crisis. And as a result, you may have inefficient firms producing uh, simply because uh, the cost of capital is really low. They're not, they're not charged the right cost of capital. Uh, they populate industry. Industry is inefficient, but, uh, you know, uh, you haven't had the right. Uh... So that's the zombie problem. was there in a big way in Japan post-financial, uh, uh, post post-their financial, post financial crisis in the, in the 1990s, uh, firms that ne were neither dead nor alive. Uh, what we mean by that is they're on their last legs, but they haven't been put out of their misery. So they, they essentially uh, are still alive, uh, uh, producing inefficiently, and in a, in a sense eroding the, uh, the profitability and the viability of existing firms in industry. How much of that I exists in industrial countries post great financial crisis is, is again an open issue. And the last uh, issue, which uh, I think the Economist has been raising in recent uh, in recent uh, uh, issues, is is basically that maybe the structure of industry has also changed. Uh, that we have got because of network effects, because of patent rights, uh, because of intellectual property protection, we've got a lot more oligopolistic in industries. And oligopolistic industries, as we've seen in Mexico, for example, tend to um, overcharge, uh, get inefficient, and underproduce. Uh, and that could account for a productivity slowdown if this is uh, a, a global problem. Regardless of how important these, these, these problems are, it doesn't seem that our global response targets these specific problems. Uh, instead, we are still uh, broadly in a situation where we think the problems are largely temporary, that a, with sufficient stimulus, we will get the global economy back on track. Uh, 
And uh, the mantra that, uh, that the IMF has been putting out since the global financial crisis is broadly uh, what the G20 also has espoused and other international as, uh, bodies have espoused. As far as monetary policy goes, press your foot firmly on the accelerator and keep it pressed. Um, whoever can do more fiscal stimulus, earlier it was everybody, but now uh, it's a little more nuanced that guys who don't have room should probably be a little more careful, but guys who have room should do all the fiscal stimulus that they can. And if you have the political room to do structural reforms, of course that would be the first best thing to do, but if you, uh, if you have the political room, go do your structural reforms. Now one gets the sense that these policy prescriptions would remain the same regardless of what the underlying problem was. That is, uh, do the stimulus and do what you can on structural reforms. And one has to ask the question, um, you know, can, can one do better? Is there something uh, um, that one could do uh, which, which would have a greater chance of, uh, of having effect? And, and, and this is where it's important to understand what the underlying causes are. And I'm going to give you three sort of uh, um, reform uh, approaches that would uh, depend on what the underlying cause is, okay? And I'm going to... Uh, give you a different take. One on, on the structural reforms, right? Um, you know, today, when we talk about structural reforms, it's each country on its own bottom, that every country is exhorted to do whatever structural reforms it can to get growth going uh, within the uh, political space available. And in fact, the G20 has put together, I think, around a 1,000 structural reforms that uh, the members have agreed to, which will move the needle uh, um, by about two percentage points over the next five years in terms of growth. Now, there is a, a very useful question to ask, which is, uh, is there a need for international coordination on these things? Won't countries at this time, when growth is really scarce, do everything they can within the political space available? Do they need exhortation by the international bodies to do A or B, or will they do it themselves? What is the what is the uh, real added value from international discussion. But uh, I think a more relevant question would be, are there structural reforms that really could benefit from some coordination, from some international discussion, from some international cooperation? Now, one example of this, which has been very successful at the G20, is, is on uh, tax, uh, uh, tax, um, tax base erosion, tax uh, avoidance, uh, trying to get the global community because that's where global cooperation can help. One country trying to crack down on tax avoidance would be problematic because companies would leave and go elsewhere. But if collectively the global globe cracks down, I think it could have effects. Of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, ways still to go on this, but that's an example where global cooperation would be would be very very useful. Question is, are there other areas? where reforms could pay off globally. And one example would be in our attitude towards oligopolistic industries because many of these straddle the globe. Uh, but instead of a common kind of discussion on what is necessary, we sometimes have individual fragmented discussions uh, which then perhaps are less, less effective. So the euro, uh, the uh, EU moves against certain oligopolistic uh, industries. Um, Emerging markets sometimes try and move against them uh, uh, and try to get a more level playing field, but it's not a coordinated effort, and, and the question is, is, is something like that uh, necessary? But um, moving away from those reforms to a set of reforms post-financial crisis, uh, which were needed, but now we have to ask, have we, have we run the course? And that is uh, reforms on bank regulation. Right. Uh, clearly, post uh, pre-financial crisis, we had moved to the point where the banking system was probably underregulated, probably misusing uh, uh, various kinds of guarantees from the uh, from the governments. Uh, effectively, too big to fail guarantees, too complex to fail guarantees, as well as too many to fail. All of which played a part in the post-financial crisis intervention. So some regulation was needed. The question we have to ask is, uh, have we done enough? Have we done it in the right places? 
Are we uh, uh, significantly better off today? And what more uh, should we do? Have we reached the limits? Now, this is where I think the answer to ha ha are we better off than we were before is probably yes. We're better off today uh, in terms of protecting the system. But there are new risks that we may have created in the process. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, is the direction we're going, does that have, do we have to take a fresh look and see whether we're going in the right direction? Let me give you a few examples, uh, more as questions that the international regulatory bodies are trying to grapple with today and uh, rather than uh, give you answers. So, for example, um, because of higher capital requirements, and, and clearly banks were over leveraged before the financial crisis, we needed higher capital. But because of higher capital requirements across the board, banks have backed off from certain kinds of activities, and in fact, sometimes even been asked to leave certain kinds of activities. Uh, one activity, for example, is a combination of market making as well as prop trading, now, um, uh, proprietary trading. Uh, banks sometimes play a very useful role in providing liquidity to certain markets. Uh, when, in fact, there's uh, a market plunge as uh, buyers get anxious on one side of the market and try and sell out, uh, sometimes institutional players, and I'm not saying banks always do the right thing here, but I'm, I'm saying that sometimes they come in on the other side and prevent the market from getting too, uh, uh, moving too much. So this is what is called liquidity provision. Institutional players do provide liquidity. And um, one question is, as banks have backed away from market making, as they've backed away from uh, uh, trading and liquidity provision, have we got uh, overly thin markets? Now, this question becomes important because I'll talk in a, in a second about the role of monetary policy in, in moving asset prices. If, in fact, one of the fundamental themes of monetary policy is to elevate asset prices so as to inspire more activity, then when those asset prices come back to fundamentals, there'll be significant market shifts. And if those market shifts are happening in very illiquid markets, those shifts could be significantly bigger. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, have we rendered the system a little more fragile with our capital requirements? The banks themselves are stronger, but the markets are weaker. And if you put the system together, perhaps it's not as strong as it could be. Second question, uh, and, and these are issues that regulators are, are paying attention to, so I don't want to give the impression that, that we're not thinking about these, but I want to ask these questions. Um, we have a very regulated banking system and a much less regulated shadow financial system, but they're both connected, and there are flows between. So if, in fact, you regulate one side a lot, what happens is activity flows to the unregulated part. Now, not only does activity flow, but increasingly human capital flows. The smart guys basically say, look, I'm going to fill out 50 compliance forms here every day. Why don't I go across the street and work for that unregulated or likely regulated hedge fund where compliance forms are few and far between? Okay? So human capital is also moving. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the system safer if the banking system is really well regulated but has lost some of the riskier activity to the unregulated system, and some of the smarter people have moved. Now, some people would argue it's a good thing if the smart people move from the banks. They were doing too much inside the banks. Uh, but I, I think it's an open question. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have your really smart people doing risk management, et cetera, is, is that uh, riskier? It's, it's, it's a question. Um, third question is, is obviously, in the same way as people are backing off from market making, uh, they're backing off from a variety of real risks. Banks today uh, backing off from SME lending. As an emerging market regulator, I can tell you the number of bank branches that foreign banks are opening in India have uh, slowed down tremendously uh, post-global financial crisis, and the kind of activity, the expansion in activity also has slowed down considerably. So. Uh, Emerging markets, small and medium enterprise financing, riskier activities, real activities, 
which would help global growth, which would help country growth, banks are backing away from. This has more of an effect, of course, in bank-based economies, less of an effect in economies which have market options, but it has an effect globally. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is the trade-off right? We've got a little more safety by increasing capital uh, requirements, but we've also increased the cost of capital to banks. We've increased the cost of doing riskier business, and they may have backed off from real uh, activity, which is necessary, uh, and without necessarily backing off from financial activity, which may be less necessary. And last question I'll pose in this vein is, we have a banking system which is taking less risk. We have a shadow financial system which is taking more risk. Uh, with monetary policy as it has been, uh, liquidity risk is something that a number of entities are taking on. Ultimately, central banks are supposed to be lenders of last resort to deal with the liquidity mismatches in the economy. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are the places the central banks can lend to, that is the commercial banks, where the illiquidity risk is going to show up next? Or is it going to show up in the shadow financial system where the central bank is not linked at all? Again, by moving uh, activity across markets, uh, have we created the potential for more risk? The bottom line here I'm, I, uh, is not so much that we should not have regulated post-financial crisis, but we have to ask ourselves, is regulation now becoming uh, uh, a little more uh, at the level where we have to ask ourselves, is more good or is it actually bad? And we have to figure out how to do better regulation, uh, and that requires a, 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 a lot of thinking. Again, uh, bodies like the FSB and Basel are take, uh, um, thinking about this. Third point, and, and this is my last uh, area that I want to talk about in terms of post-crisis responses, uh, monetary policy. Uh, post-crisis, uh, it made a lot of sense to cut interest rates rapidly uh, um, to the bone, uh, and uh, to intervene in certain markets to repair them. QE1, for example, repairing mortgage markets, was extremely valuable in the United States. But increasingly, as we've moved to QE2, QE3, and so on, and uh, as a number of central banks are adopting more and more uh, unconventional policies, including most recently negative uh, interest rates, the uh, question we have to ask ourselves is, is monetary policy doing as much good in the past? What are the unintended consequences of monetary policy at set at these levels? And is it increasingly part of the problem rather than part of the solution? Now, let me give you three criticisms that have been made about monetary policy uh, most recently. One, of course, we've already talked about. Some people argue that uh, with the level of, uh, uh, with the cost of capital so low, we're not getting enough exit from industries. If we're not getting enough exit, there's no incentive to invest either. And therefore, investment is held back by the overhang of inefficient capital, which is uh, there in existing industries. And uh, I think uh, embedded in this is the idea that existing firms have relationships with banks. Existing firms are easier to have an easier time borrowing, so they stay in existence even if inefficient while new firms, which find it harder to raise capital, are finding it harder to come in, especially when the terrain is already occupied and there's overproduction. Now, the uh, sort of extreme example of this is uh, today uh, in, uh, in steel, where there certainly is a sense there's overcapacity across the world in steel, and uh, that overcapacity needs to be reduced. But so long as... Um, bankers are willing to finance this process, that overcapacity may not get reduced, and if the cost of capital is low, the cost of financing this continuously may not be uh, that high. Uh, second point is that a number of people have ra started raising the question, um, if I cut interest rates, the theory says that you should go out and spend, right? Because you say, why save? I'm getting peanuts for saving. Instead, let me go and enjoy that new iPod or that new car, right? That's the theory. Turns out that, you know, 
we don't seem to have been encouraging consumption through lower and lower interest rates. In fact, savings rates are pretty much where they were before crisis or even a little higher. So what's going on? And one possibility people... You know, beyond a certain point... ...institution effects or, uh, you know, you, you, you've done, done this kind of thing. And, and essentially what happens is I say, I'm 50 years old. I need to save uh, twice what I have by the time I'm 60. Unfortunately, if I'm to do that at these low interest rates, I need to actually save more rather than save less. So I go out, uh, I, I stop going out, I cut back on dinners. So you cut interest rates, I cut consumption rather than I increase consumption. Okay. So the argument is that one can tell a story. Now, again, one has to verify that these stories are in fact right. But one can tell a story where at low interest rates, cutting interest rates further, especially for people who rely on fixed income investments, uh, doesn't actually enhance consumption. It enhances savings. Because in this case, uh, I find that my overall income is falling and, and therefore to preserve that income in order to meet my end of life retirement goals, I actually save more rather than save less. Um, one could also argue about uh, uh, the fact that uh, with all the spending that's going on with the enormous amounts of government debt, uh, we worry about the viability of government pensions and entitlements uh, and knowing that we're not going to be recipient of social security when we grow old, again, the savings motive gets enhanced. So more activism by the government implies enhanced uh, savings. Now, this is sort of a, 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 a version of uh, um, Ricardian equivalence. Uh, those of you who've done macro would, would, would see that. Uh, but it's something that could be, uh, could be hitting us. And, and the third uh, reason why we might have more savings is Many of these uh, unconventional monetary policies work on the basis that we elevate asset prices. We ele elevate asset prices. We uh, um, essentially create some kind of wealth effect. People feel wealthier and they go out and spend. But if, in fact, they think that this asset price is elevated unnaturally and will come back to earth, uh, essentially they may look through the current asset price increase, in fact, go back to look, there's more volatility in asset markets, I'd better save more rather than save less. So there are, I'm not saying these are, these are uh, uh, you know, uh, these are the explanation, but I think there are increasingly plausible explanations for why, in fact, uh, cutting interest rates further may not increase consumption demand. Uh, at, uh, at worst, it may be neutral, uh, at best, it may be neutral. At worst, it may actually reduce consumption demand, certainly according to uh, some of these, uh, these arguments. But even if you don't think there are these negative effects uh, and that monetary policy actually has perverse effects today rather than positive effects, it certainly has adverse effects for other countries. And uh, uh, what we've seen over the uh, post-financial crisis is the necessary reduction in interest rates in industrial countries to deal with the problem initially did spur a tremendous outflow of capital to the emerging markets, which created fragilities in the emerging markets themselves, many of which are showing up today. So these spillover effects through capital flows and through currency depreciation have had effects on the emerging markets. Let me talk quickly about currency and then, and then come to my, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, scheme. Um, you know, uh, currency effects, um, all monetary policy, when I cut interest rates, uh, typically in any economic theory, it means that my currency also depreciates. Uh, so a lot of people say, what, you emerging markets talking about currency wars, this, that. I mean, this is a natural consequence of monetary policy. Yes, it is a natural consequence, but it's a natural co consequence of ordinary monetary policy, where when I cut interest rates, the interest rate sen sensitive sectors of the economy increase their demand. Um, housing investment goes up, corporate investment goes up, consumer uh, final demand goes up. And so I have more domestic demand, which compensates for the fact that my 
uh, exchange rate also depreciates, and as a result, I draw in uh, demand from other countries. I'm giving back to the rest of the world some of my domestic demand because as my consumers get cheaper loans, they go out and buy foreign cars, they buy stuff from other countries also. On net, a more accommodative monetary policy in my country is arguably in normal times a benefit for the globe. The problem, however, is when you are in this kind of situation we are in today, where domestic demand is impervious to interest rate uh, cuts for some of the reasons I talked about. Uh, you don't get a whole lot of uh, people going out and spending. You don't get corporate investment picking up. The primary effect of cutting interest rates may be on your currency. Essentially, I'm taking demand from the rest of the world by depreciating my currency with no give back through my own domestic demand. Now, this, to my mind, this uh, um, effect of demand switching without any compensating demand-creating effects is probably more pronounced today than when we had uh, ordinary circumstances. And uh, not only do we have this demand switching, but of course we have the capital outflows which have their own adverse effects on other countries. So uh, one of the uh, arguments that a number of us in emerging markets have been making is there are consequences for the rest of the world from the aggressive monetary policy if it does very little domestically but does some harm outside, be careful about how much you do. Have a thought for the rest of the world. Now, that runs immediately against a problem, which is across the world, central bankers have what is called a domestic mandate. In the Federal Reserve's mandate or in the ECB's mandate or in my mandate, there is nothing that says, think about the rest of the world. <laughs> nothing. Uh, maybe statements about growth, there may be statements about inflation, there may be statements about price, financial stability, but nothing which says anything about the rest of the world. So the only way I take the rest of the world into account is by what is called spillback effects. If I do something which affects the rest of the world, which spills back to me, that's the only way I take things into account. But that doesn't account for the full effects. So in other words, if I do something in my country, low, let's say I've depreciated my currency so much that your industry gets destroyed. The only way I take that into account is your industry used to import some teacups from my country, doesn't do that anymore, that is the spillback effect. Small, relative to the fact that the industry is actually producing steel or something else, and the destruction of that industry creates enormous job losses in your country, but the spillover is not taken into account, it's just a spillback. So the point here is that um, monetary policy doesn't have a mandate to think about the rest of the world across central banks. Not only that, I think today there is no limit to monetary policy because central banks have a domestic inflation mandate which has both a lower bound and an upper bound. Many countries are in danger of penetrating the lower bound and falling below it. And the press, Main Street, politicians continuously uh, um, talk to them about how they're feeling in their duty by falling below the lower bound. Now, central banks could always throw up their hand and say, I've done everything I can. Now, anything more that I do would have adverse effects on our banks, on, on, uh, on the public, and perhaps uh, uh, outside. Of course, they're not allowed to talk about the outside, but uh, domestically. Why don't they do that? I think they don't do that because there is still one option that they all have, which we don't talk about. And, and that is what sometimes colloquially called the helicopter drop. Okay? What is the helicopter drop? It's basically fiscal financing of the, uh, monetary financing of the deficit. But in simple terms, it is uh, the central bank takes a whole bunch of banknotes into a helicopter, goes up 100 feet above the ground, and then starts unloading it, uh, unloading the cash from the helicopter. Anybody who finds it says, wow, this is my lucky day, and goes out and spends it on a meal or on a car or something else, depending on how much they find, and that boosts consumption in the economy, but also boosts inflation because with, uh, with limited supply and, and higher demand, you're going to get inflation. So 
The helicopter drop is always put forward as the nuclear option. In, if you haven't gone to the helicopter drop, you haven't done enough as a central banker. <laughs> and so that's always waiting. And no wonder central bankers keep trying more and more innovative stuff because uh, so long as they don't do the helicopter drop, there's still, uh, there's still an option that they can try. You never hear a central banker saying, I've run out of options. There's always something else, right? The point, however, is it's not clear to me these various options even, even necessarily work. I mean, let's, let's talk through the helicopter drop. I throw money out of the window. Somebody getting this money and say, seeing the central bank governor throwing money out of the helicopter will say, is this guy crazy? Has, has the world gone nuts? I'd better save much of this because I'm not sure what will happen. If they're spending my hard-earned money throwing it out of the window, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, I'm obviously um, joking here. But, but the real point is, again, when it's, it's not absolutely clear that throwing the money out of the window or targeted checks to beneficiaries will actually both be politically feasible as well as economically produce the right result. My sense is, yes, if you send the checks to the poorest people in the country, obviously consumption will go up. But in which country is there political room to send large checks to the poorest people? In general, the checks will have to be sent broadly. If they're sent broadly, a large number of people will simply save them. And therefore, do you get additional consumption and inflation from that? I think we, we don't really uh, have, have a strong reason to believe yes. The broader point is that uh, monetary policy uh, really works through the public's expectations. Uh, the other sort of channels through the output gap, the Phillips curve, those seem to be weaker today than they used to be in the past. The public's expectations can be anything depending on the uh, circumstances. We know very little about expectation formation. And in these troubled times, you run the risk of creating exactly the opposite expectation to the one that, that you intend. And that is why I think we are at the point where across the world, more and more aggressive monetary policy pre produces less and less understood consequences. Instead of currencies moving the way you expect, they move in a perverse way. And I think we don't really understand why that happens, but I think it does suggest reaching the limits of what monetary policy can do. Bottom line, we don't know what uh, 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 we don't know whether we've reached the limits of monetary policy domestically. I personally would argue there's more and more evidence that we probably are near that limit. But I also would say that we do know that the adverse spillover effects of aggressive monetary policy have been there for some time and are there to measure across the world. The fact that policies in in some industrial countries affects a sentiment in my markets on a daily basis is something that was not intended by them, does get experienced by me, and is a fact of life. And we need to deal with this because it puts constraints on policy in, in my country. So uh, having said the, uh, the, the, um, the argument, let me very quickly in the next two minutes uh, wrap up and, and uh, give you what, what I think we could do. Uh, basically, we have to move away, and here I'm talking largely about monetary policy. We have to move away from a situation where anything goes. Uh, we have to implicitly bring the international responsibility into the mandates of, of, of industrial countries' central banks. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I think the first thing we need to do is more, more analysis. What are the net spillover effects? Are they positive? Are they negative? And we need unbiased people in academic institutions doing this kind of study to measure what these net spillover effects are. And then we have to ask ourselves, given these net spillover effects, what kind of policies are allowed? Okay? And, and broadly, we want to say policies that have a net positive benefit for the global economy over time are probably policies we should allow. Policies that have a net negative effect for the global economy, global economy including your economy, uh, over time are pro policies that should be handled with tremendous care and sometimes even outright prohibit prohibited. Today, the only policy that is prohibited internationally is sustained unidirectional intervention in your exchange rate. 
That is, up, call it monetary policy, intervene in whatever market you want, that's okay. There's no rule against it so long as it's going towards your domestic mandate. Okay? So we need to think about whether this, in fact, is the state of affairs we want. And I would argue that you could build a system with a fair amount of flexibility. If a country, for example, is in a deep recession for 15 years and wants to get out, and the only instrument it has is depreciating its exchange rate, but that depreciation will give it a significant jump start, which will then allow it to produce strong demand for the rest of the world over time. Should we allow that? My sense is yes, because the world is on net better off over a sustained period as a result of that. Um, so I would argue we need rules of the game uh, based on how policies play out in the short term versus long term, whether they have negative effects on the rest of the world or positive effects, whether they're clear or whether they're fuzzy. And, and here I would use a driving analogy that uh, in the same way as the WTO, we can ascribe colors to policies, policies that have a net positive effect for the country as well as uh, zero to positive spillover effects for the rest of the world. Let's give it a green label. Can do it anytime you want. Policies that are a little more uncertain or short-term negative but long-term positive may be more of an orange label. And policies that may be positive for your country but certainly negative for the rest of the world now and forevermore, let's give it a red label and say that countries should shun those kinds of policies. Okay? So uh, now, of course, we're nowhere near establishing what these policies might be uh, and what colors, etc. We need a lot more work. Uh, we need studies of what policies have been beneficial, what policies have been harmful. Once we have a reasonable number of studies, we then move to international discussion. And in those discussions, countries that follow particular policies, which look more reddish or orangish, uh, explain why, in fact, they believe those policies are on net beneficial for the world. And eventually, we, we move to a conference where we talk about rules of the game and international responsibilities. And when we've got to that kind of, uh, of situation, we are not far then from enacting some kind of a global uh, structure where countries would be required to at least incorporate some element of the world into their domestic mandates for central banks. Now, in all this, I'm not talking about coordination. I'm not talking about cooperation. I'm talking about rules of the game on responsibility, that we need some element of international responsibility in the setting of monetary policy. And it can't be, yes, I have international responsibility because I, I take into account the spillback effects of my policies on the rest of the world. That is too small an effect relative to the effects that should be taken into account for the rest of the world. So that sort of is what, uh, where uh, I've been going. Uh, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, first reaction to any such thing is, yes, this is a guy from an emerging market which has no international responsibilities <laughs> telling us what to do. Uh, and the answer is, uh, by the time any of this actually gets made into policy, I have no doubt India will be one of the top three, five uh, global economies ten years from now. Uh, and, and so we will be subject to this kind of, uh, of discipline. Our monetary policies will be subject to this kind of discipline. But I think it is time we started discussing. Because today, what you find in international fora is a lot of angst about the pol monetary policies that other countries are following, but never any direct confrontation, because those policies are always OK because of the domestic mandate. Nobody wants to question the domestic mandate, and of course, politically, it would be very difficult, given uh, the kind of attention central banks are subject to today, to, to actually alter that domestic mandate. But that is why I'm calling for a period of reflection, a period of, of uh, analysis, a period of research, so that we can improve on the global monetary system that we have, so that we have policies that are more globally optimal rather than domestically optimal as we have today. Thanks, Dr. Thank you.